afternoon, everybody. My name is Eric Wright. I'm the Education Specialist for the Wisconsin Veterans Museum. And I'd like to thank everybody for coming out today for our final curator conversations of 2000, or 2021. Sorry. Uh, today, we are going to be talking about th the road to war in the Pacific one day before the 80th anniversary of the events at Pearl Harbor. But before we get started, I would just like to thank the Wisconsin Veterans Museum for their continued support and being able to allow us to offer all these free programs. Uh, that we uh, are continuing to uh, put out there on the internet for everybody to include our movie nights, our curator conversations, our trivia events, and we are looking forward to having Drink and Draw coming back this month. So if we have any Drink and Draw members out there, uh, please look forward to that on the 10th of this month. And I'd also like to thank our uh, sponsor, Generac Power Systems, uh, for their continued support as well. Uh, between them and, and uh, our foundation, uh, we are able to put these uh, virtual programs out there for everybody free of charge. And we are gonna to continue to do this into 2022 as well. Um, like I said, we're here today to uh, welcome Mr. Chris Kolakowski, the director of the Wisconsin Veterans Museum, as well as Mr. Kevin Hampton, the curator of history here at the museum as well. Uh, they're gonna be talking about uh, the road to war in the Pacific, uh, Pearl Harbor 80 years later, the Wisconsinites who were there and how we got to this uh, dreadful day of infamy uh, to begin with. Um, I am going to turn it over right now. Kevin, uh, it is all on you. Uh, gentlemen, have fun with this conversation. I hope everybody enjoys uh, uh, the discussion. And please, sorry, I forgot to mention, if you do have any questions for our guests to, or for our panel members today, please submit them via chat on the Zoom um, uh, program here. And I will put all those questions into a PowerPoint at the end where uh, everybody will be able to see them and we'll get everybody's questions answered in turn. But please submit those to chat. Um, and uh, we'll get to those questions at the very end. Uh, Kevin. Thank you very much, Eric, and thank you, ladies and gentlemen, for joining us today. Uh, for those of you that have joined us for these programs in the past, uh, especially for the what I like to call uh, the uh, curator conversation, uh, the, essentially the strategies and stories with Chris and Kevin. Uh, that's my that's my tagline going with this one for right now. So I appreciate you all joining us uh, because it is a great time for us to just have a conversation about history. And after all, what is history? What a conversation and a story. So uh, we'll, we'll get right into it, actually, because, of course, as we know, uh, tomorrow is the 80th anniversary of the attack on Pearl Harbor. And I, it seems just like last year that we were commemorating the end of World War II, uh, which, in fact, we were. Uh, with the 75th anniversary, uh, but now we are looking at the 80th anniversary of the beginning for World War II's involvement, uh, for the United States' involvement in the war. Now, Chris, for, uh, let's have a quick chat and just set the context uh, about the anniversary tomorrow, um, because popular understanding of what you're going to hear in the news over the course of the next few days and uh, what you're going to see and, and reflect on perhaps uh, does cover a lot of this idea that Pearl Harbor was a surprise attack. Um, and, and it is. It is a surprise um, to, to a degree uh, because it's not really a total surprise. Um, there's, there's plenty of, of uh, historical record, especially looking back, uh, that there is tension in that region of the world. And, and there has been for months, uh, actually, if not years, um, so we're going to talk a little bit about that, but, you know, you could even argue that it wasn't as much a surprise in popular opinion uh, or as popular perception as, or I would argue that it's not as much a surprise in popular perception as 9-11 was. You know, 9-11 uh, was, was in many ways out of the blue uh, in, in popular perception of the, of the attack, and we kind of referenced this a little bit in our talk uh, a couple months ago. Um, but for Pearl Harbor, it's not really... A complete surprise, and I'll I'll use a couple examples here just right out of the bat, and I'd like to get your uh, thoughts on a few of these, uh, Chris. These are the headlines for those of you that are going to see the shared screen come up here in a minute. These are the headlines from 80 years ago today, uh, from around Wisconsin. So here we're looking at Chippewa Falls area in Wisconsin from Saturday, December 6th, 1941. And if you notice, uh, as we go through, um, just a heads up, there may be some terminology uh, that is uh, uh, contextual or in its context, uh, it is uh, useful to that time, um, but it is not appropriate today. So I just ask you to bear with me uh, on that um, because in many ways, 
Uh, we it, you're looking at the authenticity of its time and then its moment without the editing of it. So, Chris, can I get your just just your immediate reaction there on that main headline? Gee, I wonder why you're asking me this because I had I family know. that ended up getting captured at Singapore in 1942. Uh, uh, but I will say, I will say this actually: when you look at this headline and you look at um, uh, particularly the two in the, in the, to the right there about Australia oh. and the Dutch East Indies, and we'll talk more about these as we go, and then that uneasy piece as well, straining Pacific tension, um, mm -hmm. and then the British recalling their troops to the to their posts. That's because they they've got a major Japanese invasion fleet that is moving on this that they've spotted and has actually shot down one of their reconnaissance planes already. Um, you can see there, I mean, there's a lot going on in the Pacific. People know the war in the Pacific is coming. Um, as a matter of fact, when I did uh, some research for a project I did on the defense of the Philippines, I found a Filipino general who told, wrote his wife in late November, he said, the war for all, pra all practical purposes is on in the Far East. And there were others that made that comment as well. Of course, the United States had sent a war warning message to its Pacific commanders in November 27th. So, you know, there's no question that, that war is, appears to be imminent in the Pacific. The tr question is where, when, and how is it going to start? That's the surprise on December 7th, 1941. Yep, yeah. and that's uh, something that, so I'm, I'm just gonna flip through quickly some of these more from around the state, uh, just to give a, a good representation of what people are reading this morning, 80 years ago. But I highly encourage everyone to read uh, if you can, uh, you can go online and find the front pages in a lot of cases, the front pages of a lot of newspapers uh, from perhaps even uh, uh, 80 years ago tomorrow, uh, because the morning newspaper in Wisconsin is very different than the afternoon newspaper. Uh, the headlines, of course, come out uh, before the attack actually happens. Uh, so if you're looking at um, what kind of context everyone on the state side knew about at the time, those are great things to look at. So here is you're reading the state journals headline. Uh, you can see here in the column on the right hand side, there's obviously things happening in, in the Mediterranean theater uh, with British troops charging in Libya. Um, we've got uh, things happening around in the hometown area. Uh, and an in interesting standpoint over here is, um, look at the bottom left, Chris. You see the one on the bottom left? Yeah, we're in the war now. Yep. Um, so. it, it, is, it is very interesting. Uh, so when we talk about, you know, knowing what's going on, and also it's a retired admiral, by the way, uh, that talks about it. Um, never mind that the main is, of course, the main idea or the main headline is talking about the draft that's already happening in the United States and has been happening. Um, uh, so it is... Uh, War, the war footing is not a new thing. It's not a complete difference. But over here, of course, on the right-hand side, Tokyo gets tougher, U.S. Britain prepare. Um, so it, all of these different uh, headlines as we, as we scroll through quick, um, I think really do speak to the context of its time and in its own time. Um, and so if we, uh, if we show one last one here quick. Ironically, as my mother is calling me. <laughs> um, you look here, Rhinelander, for instance, you know, Great Britain declares war against Finland, Rome, uh, Romania, and Hungary. And, you know, talking about there's obviously things happening uh, in Europe and everyone's aware of that. But then you look over here on the left-hand side and that, and that actually talks to this idea that um, FDR had reached out to the Japanese government uh, and the, there had been ongoing conversations about um, what's going on and, and why, you know, what is this for and could we avoid or can we still achieve peace or not? Um, so there is a lot of conversation and I've got plenty more I can share with you, but I'm going to move on to the next part of our conversation because in order to really understand my opinion, in order to really understand what this all means, what does tension, you know, in the East mean, um, or what does uh, uh, this look like? Um, one thing uh, that we do need to do is look at, at geography, or in the terms of geography, physical space. So Chris, walk us through what the Pacific and these tensions in the East 
look like uh, and how they've developed over the course of years? To, to understand why we get to the tense point we are at 80 years ago today on the eve of the bombing of Pearl Harbor and why Japan chooses to go to war, there, there are a variety of facts that need to be considered. Um, geographic, but there are other po geopolitical facts which we'll, which we'll get into as we go. But really to understand the Pacific War, you have to understand the geography and understand how we get to the point on the eve of the bombing of Pearl Harbor, you have to understand the geography. So here's from the West Point um, History Department. These, these are outstanding maps. Um, and this gives you a sense. This is uh, September 1939, I believe, is when it's marked. But it shows the colonial powers and the situation in the Pacific in 1939. And North being at the top, you can see in the Northeast there is the United States, Alaska, the United, continental United States, Canada. So that's North America. And then if you start working your way West, um, you see the Hawaiian Islands, Pearl Harbor, thank you. And then Midway, which you're circling with your cursor. And then if you continue to go west on the same latitude as the continental United States, you come to the Japanese home islands. And directly northwest of them is uh, the Soviet Union, which today is Russia. And then Manchuria and China, which you can see there is partly Japanese controlled in 1939 and when by the time of 1941. That's China. Directly south of China is French Indochina, which we know today as Vietnam, Laos, and Cambodia. Thailand, you can see there, Burma, India, Bur India and Burma being British at, at, at the time, at the beginning of the war, 80 years ago. Um, and then directly south of Thailand, if Kevin can keep, keep, up, with, keep up with me here, um, is Singapore, British Malaya. We've already talked about them a little bit. Um, and then the Dutch East Indies, which is Sumatra, Borneo, Java, all the way over to New Guinea, where the cursor is. That today is, we know it as Indonesia. Malaya, British Malaya, we know today as Malaysia. And of course, directly south there is Australia, the Solomon Islands to the southeast of New Guinea, right there, right where the cursor is, thank you. And then if you go into the Central Pacific, you'll notice that big red oval, with the exception of Guam, that's the Japanese Mandate Islands, and we'll talk more about them in a little bit and how Japan gets control of them in a little bit as the cursor sits on Guam. Um, Marshall Islands, Caroline Islands, and the Marianas. And then directly to the west of that, in blue, is the Philippine Islands, which was a U.S. possession at the time, was slated for independence in 1946. And north of the Philippines, I think the last piece of orientation we need to look at right now is Formosa, Taiwan which Kevin is circling with his cursor. The thing that people need to remember too about this is the vast distances of the Pacific. The Pacific is unlike anything the United States has ever fought in before, and I would argue since. From Manila to Honolulu in Hawaii is 5,000 miles. Now, Kevin, how wide is the continental United States from say, I don't know, Virginia Beach to San Francisco? That's a really good question, Chris. I would say about three maybe. 3,300 to be precise, but yes, 3,000 3, miles is a good good uh, rule of thumb. So you can sink the continental United States with room to spare between Hawaii and Manila. Hawaii to San Francisco is 2,000 miles. So when you're in Manila in 1941, you are about as far away as you can be from the continental United States and still beyond U.S. territory. Mm -hmm. When you're in Manila, you're only 500 miles from China. You're only six, 700 miles from Indochina, 800 from Singapore thereabouts. Tokyo to Singapore is 1,500 miles. So you're basically in Japan's backyard in 1941 when you're in the Philippines. And so that's something that needs to be remembered. It's, two, it's a 2,000 mile uh, journey just to get into the periphery of the Pacific Theater of Operations in Hawaii. And then from there, it's multiple thousands of miles to get over to the to the Asian coastline. Mm -hmm. I think with this map, it's it's really uh, interesting too. If you're looking at the dates uh, in particular and how this expansion in this region uh, from both imperial powers, because at this point you, you they both were imperial powers. Um, you have this idea of you know Pearl Harbor is is right back here at the turn of the century, but look at how Midway. Uh, came into possession in, in 1867. You have the same thing with Alaska. Um, and 
Alaska stretches all the way out here to Atu, um, the island of Atu, which is, is, of course, a different conversation for a different day, but an excellent one about World War II uh, and its involvement. But you're looking also, too, at the dates that coincide with the Japanese expansion, which is in here in red. Uh, you know, essentially, it's almost like a one for one. You have 1898, Pearl Harbor, 1899, Wake, and here you've got uh, Japanese expansion 1899. Uh, in 1887. But notice in particular the expansion jump. So you've got a lot of late 1800s and then all of a sudden 1920, 1931. And uh, there are very significant reasons for that. Yep. Yeah. Um, really, to, there's, there's a, as uh, the term has been bandied about, and it was a contemporary term, the race for the Far East. Because a lot of what you see on this map until 1898 or thereabouts. Mm -hmm. was Spanish, yep. particularly this in the Central Pacific. And there's a lot of things that are coming together in the late 1890s that start to push push this race. One is the laws, the departure of Spain after the Spanish-American War. That's when they cede the Philippines, Guam, um, and uh, Puerto Rico to the, uh, to the United States as protectorates mm -hmm. um, and as territories. But really, to understand this, we have to go back actually to the 1850s when Commodore Perry shows up in Tokyo Bay. Japan had been closed to the world for over 250 years, um, over, uh, yeah, over 250 years since the 1600s. Mm -hmm. It societally and technologically was basically had more in common with medieval Europe than it did any of the industrialized nations in 1853. So when Perry shows up with steamships, this really surprises Japan. Now, the other thing you need to understand is that as Japan begins to modernize, because they go on a crash course of modernization, and they move technologically from medieval Europe to 1941, from 1853 to 1941, in that same time frame of temporally. Yeah. But one of the things the Japanese quickly discover is that, the, and this is true even today, the home islands can feed themselves. They have, they have natural resources, they can feed themselves. But just about everything else you need to, to manage a modern, to supply a modern economy has to be imported. Mm -hmm. Oil, steel, rubber, which in those days was not synthetic, tin, you know, all the different raw materials for an economy to say nothing of a war machine and of a military. And a lot of those are imported from French Indochina, Burma, the Dutch East Indies, Malaya. And so Japan, as they quickly surge as a modern military power, begin to def what, what they call and what it was called by, by some of the politicians, the line of national interest. The line of national sovereignty, which they defined, was the home islands plus Okinawa, which is the Ryukyu Islands that you see right there. That's the line of national sovereignty. The line of national interest is the stuff that the places that they need either for security or the resources that they need to keep their economy and their war machine going. And so that leads them to war with China in 1895, where they get Formosa. That leads them to fight the Russians in 1904-1905. They ultimately that will ultimately be a domino that leads to the annexation of Korea, southern Sakhalin Island, and the Kuriles that you see up there. So you see them start to expand as you correctly point out. And then in World War I, when World War I breaks out, Japan uses the opportunity presented by war in Europe. Mm -hmm. You'll hear this again in a few minutes. The opportunity presented by war in Europe to seize G uh, German colonies. In fact, they, they capture Tsingtao. They're the major army, along with the British, a, a British contingent to be precise. It's mostly Japanese that take Tsingtao in China. And then they also take the German colonies and are given mandates by the League of Nations after the war over the Marianas, the Carolines, and the Marshalls, former German colonies. The Australian mandate, by the way, is the other part of the German colonies when they split up the old German empire in Asia. And those get, go to the Australians, along with the Gilbert Islands, you can see there being British um, as well. So all of a sudden you'll notice by 1920, 1921, Japan, has moved in basically the span of 40 years, 30 years, 40 years, from basically the home islands, Okinawa and Formosa, to become a prominent Central Pacific power. 
At the same time this is going on, the United States takes the Philippines, they take Guam from the Spanish, as we've discussed. The Dutch have moved into the Dutch East Indies, although they've been there before. The British have solidified their hands, their, their hold on India, Burma, and Malaya. As a matter of fact, Malaya from 1895 to 1941 was a net credit to the British Empire. People talk about India being the crown jewel of the British Empire, which it was, but most profitably and some of the most important resources for the entire British Empire came from Malaya from 1895 onward. So these are very important economic, not just to their possessors, but also to the world economy as well. And so by 100 years ago right now, as a matter of fact, the Washington Naval Conference is going on to discuss naval li arms limitations and things like that in 1921. Japan is at the table, along with the British, the French, the Italians, and the Americans. And Japan has, in her own right, become a significant world power. Mm -hmm. And so, but there's also this feeling among the Japanese that the two great rivals in the Pacific eventually there will be a fight with the United States. That's already a feeling that is starting to germinate in Japan. And it is a prophecy that will be self-fulfilling over the next 20 years. My, my question actually, and this is not um, at all what we've talked about so far, but why was the feeling, the inevitability of the conflict between the United States and the Japanese empire versus those that, perform or those that are the immediate uh threat which you see all these colonies down here is it because these colonies were already in decline that's actually a really good question and it wasn't the idea that they might fight the united states exclusively but when japan when this starts to germinate japan until 1922 had an alliance a treaty alliance with britain they had a treaty alliance of understanding with the french so there's there's a, a different set, and they'd had they'd had for years. The only portal to the west was maintained by the Dutch at Nagasaki. So they've always had a good relationship with the Netherlands East Indies. But also, which country showed up in Tokyo Bay and humiliated Japan? Right. It was the United States, and that is not forgotten. There's actually a really good book by a guy named George Pfeiffer uh, called "Breaking Open Japan" that tells the story of Perry, particularly from the Japanese side. And he ends his book with Pearl Harbor and charts this as this is the first thing. The United States, Japanese never forgot that humiliation. It was the closest thing. Japan had never lost a war until 1945 in its 2600 year history. The closest it came to that, at least in their perception, was 1853 when Perry showed up and rendered, you know, and with his technology had rendered their, uh, their technology not just obsolete, but artifactual yeah well and if you look at um look at the expansion in the immediate backyard if you will uh, look at the dates in particular who's the newest kid on the block it's the exactly. united states it was the newest one that's trying to make its stamp on uh you know in the world power scene because if you look, all of these had been in possession for, most of them have been in possession for several decades by the time uh, we even show up in the Philippines, practically. That's absolutely right. If you look, the United States is expanding west. Mm -hmm. Japan is expanding southeast. They're on, a they're on a geographic collision course. Oh, yeah. To say nothing of what we've been talking about, about the mentality so far as well. And you can see that, you know, go straight yeah. through, there's, there's a, a deliberate line going straight through. So you can, you can already imagine, you know, okay, the next logical progression. And I will point out another irritant the Japanese feel about the United States is the immigration laws of the 1880s and beyond. The Chinese and the Asian Exclusion Acts mm. really stick in the craw of the Japanese. And the Chinese, I'm, I, I don't want it to, that to go unremarked either, but from the perspective of Japan, they're very concerned about that. They feel like that's a, a slight as well. Yeah. So there's a, there's a lot of uh, Japan. Japan wants to go after the biggest kid on the block. You're right. Yeah. And for some of those headlines that we were just looking at just before this, this part of the conversation, I just want to point out, you know, you know Britain, Britain recalling all its troops to Singapore, uh, calling them up for active duty. That's down here. Uh, that that response that you know FDR was saying waiting on the Japanese response 
is in regard to a buildup of military forces on the border and just off the coast here of French Indochina. Um, so these are the locations that you know are in the newspaper necessarily. Pearl Harbor isn't in the newspaper. It's not. Nor is the Philippines. Nor is the Philippines, and that and that's what I was going to bring up next. Um, so you know we're talking a lot about in the newspaper. So that, that that does add that element of surprise, if you will, because the tension that they're referring to only cite other colonies, other uh, countries' locations. It does not specifically cite. It does you know it does mention general tension between the U.S. and Japan, but it does not talk about other than um, at one point Manila is mentioned in the newspaper eighty years ago today as uh, the initial evacuation orders are being considered uh, just in case things happen, um, which is very interesting because it's full 24 hours before, you know, we, anything will come up again about the Philippines. Um, and MacArthur is, of course, mentioned, uh, just to give you that one, Chris. Um, <laughs> Thanks, Kevin. Uh, no problem. Um, but, you know, he's, you know, it'll be, it's, it's I think the articles, and I'll read it, uh, some, uh, it's in the Eau Claire Telegram, and it's talking about um, MacArthur's considering further evacuations as necessary, depending on how these talks go. Um, but everything is talked about here and here, not all the way out here. So if you're looking at it from a geographical standpoint, the conflict and tension is focused here. The thing that makes Pearl Harbor such a surprise, if you will, is that it almost hits the back door of these holdings, of this tension, you know, zone. Right. It skips, and obviously the other other attacks that don't happen in consecutive or concurrently or you know within 20, 48 hours hit these other places. But the fact that the very first strike, if you will, is in the back door of our footprint. Uh, leads to some of that, I think, perception of the surprise. Well, and that's, that's something a lot of studies of Pearl Harbor have pointed out is the great failure of the United States at Pearl. And we can get into this more because I, I, there's a lot of reasons why Japan chooses this operation to start the war. Um, and, and I'd like if we can talk about that in a little bit. But one of the things is that the United States is not, doesn't believe the Japanese would do this would steam a significant part of their battle fleet, including six aircraft carriers, which actually at the time was the largest air force, aircraft carrier force in the world, all the way through the Battle of Midway, um, would steam them 4,000 miles from Tokyo, strike Pearl Harbor, and then disappear. But that's exactly what they do. Mm -hmm. It worked for the Russians at Port Arthur in 1904. That's how they started the war with the Russians and crippled their fleet at Port Arthur. Um, and uh, they were trying to replicate the feat again uh, during, uh, in 1941. So there's a couple maps that I just want to show up first. And this um, first one, which is one you shared with me a little bit ago, uh, talks a little bit about essentially the disposition of those troops, of those uh, main forces, if you will, of the Japanese army. But then the next one is actually... Um, the major essentially objectives, which I do want to bring up as well, um, showing the different objectives on the different islands. Um, so Chris, if you could tell us a little bit about this, about the concentration of uh, Japanese forces in the eve of the attack, you know, in, in this in case, it's November 1941. Well, one thing we need to talk about first before we get to November 1941, actually, if you could bring up the other map real quick, because we, we need to start the war in China. Because yeah, do you want me to the, bring up the, the plan, the objectives? Yeah, yeah okay. bring up the other one. Um, because one of the, the big thing that happens with, that really kind of, if in my, in my interpretation, the final great turn on the collision course to war with the West is when Japan in, uh, starts the war with China. They've taken over Manchuria in 1931. And then in 1937, uh, war starts with China at the Marco Polo Bridge in July 1937. By 1941, Japan owns most of Eastern China. You may have noticed that on the previous map that we were using. But they're bogged down, there's no end in sight. There's allied aid that is getting in through the Burma Road. But Japan is starting to, as they're expanding their forces in preparation for a potential showdown with the West, but also to sustain their war effort against China, 
By 1941, that's four years old with no end in sight. Now, what happened September 1st, 1939? Germans uh, invade Poland. Germans invade Poland. Following year, they attack France. France falls May, June, 1940. Japan, which the government had started thinking about a withdrawal from China, suddenly has opportunities for created by a European war because with the French and the Dutch have their home countries overrun by the Germans, their grip on their colonies and their ability to aid their colonies in the East is loosened. So the Japanese negotiate going into French Indochina, the Northern half in 1940, and then take the Southern half by force in July, 1941. The British and the Americans will not stand for this. And particularly the second one, because it puts Japanese aircraft within air range of Singapore, the United States, Britain, and the Dutch embargo Japan, shut off all trade and all oil. So Japan is now faced with an issue in the summer of 1941. They have three options. Number one, you can do nothing and you're literally going to run out of gas. You're literally going to run out of fuel by the summer of 1942. Done. Economy's over. The fleet can't move, tanks can't move, army's done, air force won't fly, period. Yep. Obviously, they're not going to do that. That would be highly irresponsible to do that. It's not a real option. Number two, you can retreat to a nation that's not lost a war in 2,600 years. How palatable do you think that option is? Right. So that brings you to the third option which is to seize the resources you need by force. In other words, advance your line of national interest and seize what you need, which is that blue area, the Southern resources area right there. Okay. Yeah. Now, if you do that, and in a minute, I'm gonna flip you back to the other map. But if you do that, what stands between the Southern resources area and the home islands? Uh, several airfields. On what archipelago? Philippines. Philippines. Yep. Are you seriously going to leave the Philippines unattacked? The United States may not move at all, but can you really run that risk? Especially right. because the highway through the South China Sea, just like today, the highway through the South China Sea runs right by the Philippines. Yep. Well, and if you look at what the United States had been doing in the last you know, 12 months up to this point, they had actually been adding further forces to that region, uh, bolstering the defenses that are already in the way, if you will. Part so of the Wisconsin not... National Guard will end up out there before the war starts. Mm -hmm. yep. And that's something that you have to take into mind as well, because it's not just a buildup of, you know, it's not an arms race or an army buildup on one side. There are reinforcements that are being pumped into this region as well, from our side of it as well. That's correct. By the fall of 1941, there are three great pillars of Allied defense in the Pacific. You got the British Force Z, Prince of Wales and Repulse at Singapore. You've got Douglas MacArthur's Far East Air Force, which is building and, as you mentioned, is getting stronger by the month, by, by certainly by the week, mm -hmm. in the Philippines. And the third one, because it's been there since 1940, is the United States Pacific Fleet in Hawaii. And so if, you, if you're going to go to war with the West, which is what Japan decides to do, they look at these three options and they decide that war with the West is the, is the least risky option, is the most desirable course of action. Mm -hmm. If you're going to go after them, you have to go after, um, you have to go after those three pillars at the outset of the war. And so that's, that's the genesis of the Pearl Harbor attack. Now, if you can flip over, I want to, this is something that is sometimes missed, but I, I want, if you can go back to that previous map, as you can see it right there on that map, the, the one we just clicked off, the Pearl Harbor attack, but it's, it's not just that. Right. It is part of a much more coordinated attack. The Japanese commit 20% of their ground forces and virtually their entire Navy to the expedition southward. Throughout the whole war, by the way, just so everybody knows, throughout the whole war, there are never less than three, four million Japanese soldiers on the mainland of Asia. Mm -hmm. That's the big war, ground war for the army. But the army will commit 20% of its forces to attack 
and conquer the area. The dashed line is the Jap is the Japanese objective, the initial Japanese objective. They'll ultimately push a little bit beyond that uh, before the Battle of Midway. Um, but it's a coordinate. It's part of a coordinated strike, and because of the international dateline. If you ask most Pacific veterans that were out there in the Far East, the war started December 8th. December 7th is a quiet day. Because yep. 7.55 in the morning in, in Honolulu, when the Japanese strike Pearl Harbor on December 7th at 7.55 a.m., is 2.55 in the morning Manila time. And the same, it's on the same time zone, by the way, as Singapore. So you're right. talking three o'clock in the morning. For most people in the Philippines, for most people in, in the Far East, the war starts either with a radio report or a ringing telephone in the darkness. Yeah. Unless you're the poor border guards at Hong Kong that get swept up by the Japanese before you even know the war has started, or the Marine Legation Guards at Peking as well that, that suffer that same fate within just a few hours. Yeah. But the point is that Japan is going to strike. They're going to, and you can see there on the map, the Southern Army is what they create to do it. 14th Army with two and a half divisions are going to go to the Philippines. They're expected to take that in 50 days. 15th Army is going to go in advance to Thailand, partly with uh, take forces there and then push into Burma. But ultimately, they will advance into Burma, southern China, and reach the Indian border before, the, before May, May 1942 is out. 16th Army is going to invade the East Indies once the Philippines have been taken. Um, and they will end up capturing the Dutch East Indies by March, by early to mid-March. And then 25th Army, with four divisions, is going to go after Singapore and is expected to take it within 70 days, which they do. Singapore will surrender on the 15th of February, 1942, largest surrender in British history. Mm -hmm. But the attack on Pearl Harbor is done to both surprise and shock the Americans, just like it had surprised and shocked the Russians when they did something similar in 1904 at right. Port Arthur. Mm -hmm. But the other thing that the Japanese are expecting to do is it is going to take a major piece off the chessboard because as long as the US Pacific Fleet sits in Hawaii and can steam west with battleships and aircraft carriers, it will throw this timetable off. Yep. And that's why they risk, and it is, it's a significant risk when you think about the Japanese Navy. And you think about the fleet carriers they have, they commit their six best fleet carriers of all the 10 that they have, and the other ones are not as good, um, into this attack. That tells you how important the Japanese felt that taking out the Pacific fleet at Pearl Harbor was to their objectives. Yep. And so and we should not forget that, that December 7th is part of an overall, overall plan, an overall scheme for the Japanese. Yeah. And that's important to remember is on this map here in particular, you know, you're looking at these different invasion points on the Philippines and you're seeing the invasion points here into Thailand and Malaya uh, and so on and so forth. It's very important to recognize that the base of operations, again, is way back here. And in order to get there to reinforce, because yes, you have Force Z, but Force Z is two ships. Here you have an entire fleet uh, that has the possibility of really messing up your your transportation routes because if your drive is this direction is in a southeastern direction you could be hit from the backside so that's what makes taking of wake island hitting the marshall islands uh hitting the saipan and the marianas um interrupts that direct line to reinforce the philippines you know at that point if you are taking these interim points the fleet would have to pass either between two occupied islands and the main island, which would be a terrible idea um, because you'd fall under the possibility of attack from both sides um, or go straight through. So that's what makes these points that we can talk about maybe at the end, if we do have time, just as significant. However, not as the knockout blow as you will see here with Pearl Harbor. You're absolutely right. It's, it, it's all of a piece. Mm -hmm. And the whole point, and one of the things that should be pointed out is the whole point, Japan is going to go to war, they're going to seize what they need, and then they're going to hold this perimeter. You've seen this perimeter in a red line here or the dash line before. They're going to hold this perimeter, and it is expected within a year or two that exhaustion will force the allies to the negotiating table. Just like what happened with the Russians, 1904, 1905. Right. 
they are basing their strategy on their experience with beating Czar Nicholas at that time. And that's what they're that's what they're aiming for. And this this uh, containment zone, if you will, or this this occupation, uh, you know, cut off the line of communication to the Philippines. This bubble is interesting when you evaluate it from the Japanese perspective. Um, but when you look at it from the United States perspective, once Hawaii is hit, the immediate reaction is, "What's next? What are they going to try for next? Are they going to land on Hawaii? Are they going to go and land on California?" Um, you know, that's that is a fear that does truly um, grip the nation for well over a year and a half after the attack on Pearl Harbor. I mean, there are still talks, you know, concerns about a Japanese landing on the West Coast well into 1943 um, even. So it is something that, you know, if hindsight, you know, history is hindsight 2020, you know, oh, they were going to, you know, they're going to stay in this bubble. The reality is the what ifs, you know, the, the what ifs from both sides. And if you want to know something about West Coast war hysteria, um, the actually one of the better basic overviews is the U.S. Army official history mm -hmm. defending the United States and its outposts. And I also recommend reading Barbara Tuckman's section on Joe Stilwell, because he was one of the senior American ground commanders in December 1941. And some of the absolute hysteria in San Francisco and L.A. And some of it was warranted because Japanese submarines did surface off the Pacific and shelled Santa Barbara at one point. They actually had to move the Rose Bowl, the only time it's never been played in Pasadena. The 1942 Rose Bowl was moved east for fear that the Japanese might try and bomb it. And of course, it's that hysteria that also produces the order in uh, February of 1942 for the internment of Japanese and Japanese Americans. Right. Um, not a very happy chapter in American history, but the hysteria was there. Yeah. And it needs to be remarked upon for sure. Well, and you've got also, you know, the the incendiary bombs uh, that that are landing throughout. Uh, there's a great map actually that shows a location of where these balloons, you know, hit. In most cases, in the middle of Oregon, in the middle of the woods, and um, but you know that that's that hysteria of you know seeing the sighting of submarines off the coasts and things like that. Um, is always present. And that actually dovetails us because it is uh, with an eye on the clock, dovetails us right next into the sequence of events that takes place over the next 24 hours. Um, because sightings of the submarines uh, on the West Coast is actually kind of uh, mirroring the idea of how this attack began on Pearl Harbor uh, with the submarines off the coast of the, of the uh, uh, islands. Um, in fact, there's one uh, Wisconsin, Wisconsinite, uh, William, uh, leaner who's on the USS Ward uh, just off the coast or off the uh, entry to the port uh, and they he actually accounts or recounts how they sighted an unidentified submarine periscope and fired on it in the early morning hours of the 7th. So Chris would you be able to take us through just a very quick um, sequence of events and how things come up while I bring up the next image? So about 6.30 in the morning on December 7th, destroyer USS Ward is guarding the, the entrance to Pearl Harbor and they, they have harbor gates they need to open and close. And there's a uh, uh, oiler transport, it's one of the support ships, Oglala, that is coming in. And they notice, one of the sharp-eyed crewmen notices that uh, there appears to be a submarine passing behind it, trying to get into the harbor at the same time. The Japanese had launched six two-man midget submarines to try and attack Pearl Harbor at the same time. Um, one, one crewman gets captured, um, they, the attack fails, but the submarine is noticed and uh, the ward fires, it's a perfect shot, right into the base of the conning tower and the submarine sinks. That gun, by the way, is now on display on the grounds of the Minnesota State Capitol at St. Paul because most of the ward's crew were Minnesota Naval Reservists. And so that occurs on, off the mouth of Pearl Harbor, um, right down basically where you have the cursor right there. And at 6.30 in the morning, Ward reports that they had engaged a submarine um, outside and it was a no-go area. So unauthorized traffic was, fight, was a free fire zone. But so they report that um, 6.30 in the morning. Soon thereafter, I think it's 7.15 or so, is a radar blip is spotted at long range from the radar up at, up at uh, Opana radar site at the northern tip of Oahu. Uh, 
Um, it's believed to be a flight of B-17s coming in from the, from the West Coast. There, those B-17s, by the way, to your point about the air reinforcement of the Philippines, are flying in, are going to stop fuel, and then they're going to fly out via Wake and Guam, and their destination is MacArthur's Air Force at Clark Field. Of course, they never make it. In reality, that is the first wave, 183 Japanese attacking uh, torpedo bombers, fighters, and dive bombers who are on their way in. And they will achieve, they'll come over Kahuku Point, they'll sight Kahuku Point and about 740 or 748, 750, they'll come over Oahu and the commander, uh, Fuchida, will issue the orders for the attack. And then they'll start in two waves, the Japanese will strike virtually every air and naval uh, installation on the island that they, uh, that they can. And I should point out, we've identified in our research, because people are going to ask, and I'm going to head off the question right now. We've identified so far over 200 badgers at virtually every installation on the island, of whom over 55 were killed during the raids on Pearl Harbor on December 7th, 1941. Yeah. And that's something that I wanted to bring up this map, because we talk a lot about, you know, the attack on Pearl Harbor. And that is a, a truly, you know, one small part, actually, of this greater attack on Oahu. You know, it, it doesn't have the ring necessarily of, of it, but you're looking at all these different installations across this island. And, you know, you talk about, you know, Rhoda Ziesler, who, who we feature and talk about um, at Schofield Barracks. We've got Badgers at Wheeler Field. We've got Badgers that are actually part of the coastal artillery units uh, over here in the different radar sites. Um, so it is something to think about that, yes, we'll talk a lot about Battleship Row, and Pearl Harbor and the naval impact, but also keep in mind all these different remote installations because the information like at Schofield Barracks, the experience at Schofield Barracks is going to be a little bit different than somebody on a battleship in the air, in the battleship row area. So we'll dovetail here quickly because one eye on the clock again um, to this photograph, which is one that you and I have talked a lot about, Chris. Um, but this actually looks to be within about the first 15 minutes of that first wave, um, because within that first 15 minutes, as you're looking at, this is a captured photograph uh, can, after I the can fact. Tell you, I can tell you within five minutes when this was taken. Perfect. Because Arizona you... blew up at 8.08. Yep. Arizona is still alive and intact in this, and you're circling it with the cursor. Yep. Um, Arizona is still alive and intact in this photograph. So this is prior, this is within 10 minutes of the first, first attacks it's yep. at 8.55. So Oklahoma it's... is listing, sorry, yep. oh, go Oklahoma, ahead. West Virginia has been struck by another, is being struck by another torpedo as well. So this is, this is, would be about 8.05, Yeah. what I'd say, give or take, give or take a few minutes. And then uh, what I was going to say is that at, at 7.57, so this is literally two minutes, you know, after... California is already mentioned, this is California over here, is already reported as uh, sitting low at the, at the stern. And you can see California is already low in the water here. You can yep. see the ripple uh, from, the, from the first impact. Um, so this is truly within minutes, you're right, of the first uh, uh, bombs hitting. And like you said, Arizona is completely untouched so far. Um, one thing I love about these, you know, diving into the details here, you can see Wheeler Field in the background is on fire. Uh, they were already hit. Here's the oil uh, containers uh, over there as well. This is Fort Island for those of you looking for reference. Um, but what I love to do with these great photos is to zoom in. And is it zooming in on your screen there, Chris? Yes, it is. So look at the West Virginia. You see that water plume? That's a torpedo explosion. Uh-huh. And look yeah. back here. This is an entry point for another torpedo. And there's the plane that dropped it. Yep, taking off on its embank on its way back out. Yep, it's pulling um, so out, can, pulling out of its run. Yep, so you can see yeah. the trails of the other torpedoes that have already come in, and for probably this trail is this torpedo, and you can see the ripple effect of the water right off there. But the moment of impact that is captured just by this photo alone, you can see the ripples coming off here of the of the Oklahoma that's already been hit and starting to list. Oh, and some Virginia. of those oil stains too. Right. The Virginia is literally, this is the- West, most, West Virginia, West Virginia. West Virginia, sorry, I paraphrased. Um, but you can see just by the angle of the conning towers, 
that it's art it's reeling from that impact just in that moment because it looks almost like it's listing more than the oklahoma is but it'll settle again back well it's west just, virginia west virginia almost suffered oklahoma's fate right. but it was it was very quick damage control on the part of west virginia that uh that got her going to the bottom on an even keel but yep. oklahoma of course is the one that rolled over um and yeah she's she's minutes from rolling over as well yeah um, the attack starts at, at 7 55 but you can tell this is a photograph of the attack underway yeah and this is uh something i also want to point out is that if you're zooming in on these photos you can see right there the flag on the stern there of the nevada um which is in, in, in my opinion a, a very impactful uh, image you can see the american flag flying there but also take note of the Arizona of those canvas covers on the bow in the front because they're getting ready for church service. It's Sunday morning. Right. Um, and actually take a look here at the little, uh, uh, the ships, the uh, tenders, not tenders. Well, I forgot what they're called. Whale um, boats. They're the whale boats. The whale boats. Yeah. Um, you know, coming up on, on the ship because they're actually preparing to ferry people to the ship for service. In fact, there's a Wisconsinite uh, who's on one of the ships on the other side of Fort Island, who's standing on the dock waiting for one of these ships to come or one of these boats to come get him, to take him because they don't have, uh, the only Protestant service was on a different battleship. And so these are full of people as well. Um, but I love- way, I do want to remark on the flag because if you've seen the movie Tora, 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 there's that famous scene of the getting ready to raise the flag and they race through the uh, national anthem. That really happens. Yeah. And that is that flag on Nevada. Yep. And so that's um, how you know it's after eight o'clock because they always did they always raise the colors at eight AM. That was this that was the impact. I also want to bring up this photo, which is another captured photo afterwards, which I again find so impactful. Um, this is Fort Island, of course, Battleship Rose on this side, Wheeler Fields over here, but you can see the planes in the air. Um, from a couple strikes here you can see one of those impacts it's a little bit harder to tell but you can already see california is sitting low in the stern which right. again was only minutes into the into the attack um, i've seen this one dated stamped to within the first five minutes of the attack yeah i think it's actually from uh if if i remember correctly i saw someone actually was trying to assess it and thought it was from the same plane that they had done a loop around fort island uh and were coming around for a second pass um as they were photographing it but i could be wrong on that it could have been a, a someone else uh someone was incorrect about that but if you look here you can already see the oklahoma again looking at the conning towers the angles at which at the oklahoma is just still listing there to the side um west virginia is in the same uh, situation so anyway um looking at some of these detailed photos is fantastic because again you're looking down here and look down there there's your whale boat again mm-hmm so I just want to bring that up because I, I love going through the details and the context. You can see more of those oil uh, containers and storage over there, um, the dry dock areas. Um, but looking at photos in detail, just like looking at, at uh, the details that are in a headline or, you know, where is the placement of the article? It can be just as important to understand that context. And of course, uh, I, 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 do you want to cover anything else about the attack itself, Chris? I think we're good. I know we're getting a ton of questions from what right. Eric tells me. So we probably, I, I think we can leave it there. Um, I, and let's, I'll, let's I'll point out what the audience thing. wants. I'll point out one last thing uh, that I just want to mention um, because it would be, uh, it would be terrible of me to do so or not do so, um, which is 80 years ago yesterday, uh, the 5th of December, the three Barber brothers uh, from New London sit for this portrait that they mail home for mo to mom and dad uh, for their Christmas gift. And these three brothers are one that we've talked about quite a bit uh, over the last few months because uh, all three served on the Oklahoma and they were finally identified 80 years later and were laid to rest on September 11th, 2021. Um, and that's something that we can talk about there at the end, but I just wanna share this portrait with you because this was their parents' Christmas gift from the three boys. And on that note. Well, fantastic uh, uh, presentation, gentlemen. we got a lot of positive comments on it. Uh, and we do, you're right, Chris, have uh, quite a few questions as well.
uh, to go along with uh, your presentation and we'll jump right in on those. Let me just pull that up real quick. Uh, first question, um, were the islands acquired by Japan and the U.S. Uh, by force, or were there any that are required through diplomatic means? vast majority of the islands that we talked about, the territories, were acquired through diplomatic means. Some were force and diplomatic recognition afterwards. Yeah. But before 1941, the territories we were talking about were mostly diplomatic with some force. Uh, the next question. Uh, why didn't the Americans pay much attention to the work that Billy Mitchell had done? Uh, speaking of a, a past period of conversation, uh, predicting a Japanese attack on Pearl Harbor 18 years earlier and Harry Yarnell's war games of nine years earlier, which were almost exact models of the plan that the Japanese used. I think we touched on this a little bit in our conversation and it, it, it's a, it's not, a, everybody knew technically, it was technically possible to attack Pearl Harbor from the air and do damage. Right. The question was, um, were, did the United States, did the, did the people on the ground, did the, did the uh, War Department, the Navy Department in Washington believe the Japanese would really do that? Right. Would they really steam a, the fleet that would be necessary to do that from Tokyo? Would they be able to do it without anybody knowing and pull it off? And of course the Japanese did that, but the United States did not credit them with that capability and didn't, didn't really think it was plausible. They right. were more concerned about the initial move on going against the Philippines. Well, and remember that one of the examples that we used when we were talking about Billy Mitchell back at the, um, a few months ago was Force Z and the sinking of that task force um, by the Japanese that hasn't happened yet. Um, but Force Z was really proving the theory that it could be done. Um, and it was done then, of course, and for, you know, for the first time by truly just air power um, in, a, in a combat situation. So, so this really is not necessarily a, it's not a first test of that theory, but it, it is proving the point. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, next question, gentlemen. Uh, why were the small islands so important to Japan, as well as the U.S., that they would go to war over them? Um, and then this is kind of a three-part question. Uh, I'll let you hit the first part, and then we'll move on to the next uh, couple of sections there. Chris, I'd I jump in on this one, if you wouldn't mind, um, at least initially. Go for uh, it. The small islands, in, in particular, I'm assuming we're referring to, like, Wake and, and, and other places like that, which uh, we did kind of try and cover a little bit with the map which is that's the supply route. That's the way to get to the Philippines. Um, so to cut off that line of communication with the Philippines, it really is isolating MacArthur and the forces in the Philippines um, that is the biggest strategic uh, a, a point that they're trying to make at the time. It's also not just the, the islands themselves as ports and bases, it's airfields. Right. Because you then have an unsinkable aircraft carrier that you can use to control through well, by stocking it with air power, right. you can use it to control the sea around you. And you'll see that again and again in the Pacific War, the importance of airfields. Uh, yeah, Guadalcanal, Guadalcanal probably yeah. being the most famous example. And, it's, and that's true on both sides. You know, the, the Japanese try and you know, establish a, an airfield in New Guinea uh, near Buna so they can hit Australia. And so that's why the 32nd Division is put in where they are, is to take out those airfields. Same thing with the end of the war. The reason why we take Okinawa, striking distance. Yeah, it's the air bases. It's also the harbor for yeah. potential use, for future use against the projected invasion or for the projected invasion of Japan. Right. The second part of that question, gentlemen, is did Japan want everything, including Hawaii? And also, why was the U.S. interested in an island so far west? And I think by that, they mean the Philippines. Oh, okay, gotcha. Um, oh. Japan didn't want Hawaii. They, they thought about it later. But one of the things Japan didn't realize the United States Navy would be able to do was refuel at sea. 
as far as they were concerned, based on their judgment of the U.S. Navy's capabilities, Hawaii was so far from where they were expecting to be. You know, if you look at that dashed line, there's still 1,500 miles between Hawaii and the Marshall Islands. As far as the Japanese were concerned, that was out of the effective range of the U.S. fleet once you took Guam and Wake and the Philippines. So, you know, Hawaii to them was, man, we'll just neutralize the fleet there and then we'll move on with what we need. It's going to be a short war anyway, is the thinking. Yeah. As for what drives the U.S. to the Philippines, um, Far East trade and the race for territory out there. You look at the position of Manila right. um, and its value as a port and geostrategic. Kevin, I don't know if you have anything to add on. No, no, nothing that would be anything more substantial than that. I mean, you're looking at vying for position at the world stage, honestly. Um, you're looking at all those colonial powers that have those standings in that area of the world and wanting to compete. The next question, gentlemen, were there differences of opinion between the Japanese Army and the Navy with regard to the attack on Pearl Harbor? That's a Chris question. No idea. <laughs> I mean, I know the answer, but I don't know details. <laughs> this, to be quite frank, is a, is a presentation in itself. Yeah. Um, the Japanese uh, relationship between the Army and the Navy, to call it abysmal, their level of cooperation to call it abysmal would be a, a compliment. Yeah. Um, the Army didn't support the operation. They certainly didn't want to allocate troops for seizing Oahu. And they had, an, it, was, it was just using what they commit, what they were willing to do to the southern resources area. They wanted to fight and win the war in China. That's what the Army wanted to do. The Navy was far more interested in fighting the United States. And you will see that debate over and over, particularly in the Guadalcanal and then the New Guinea campaigns in 1942. Um, but there was differing opinions. The Navy, as far as they were concerned, this, this, this was, they had to take out the Pacific Fleet first thing because that was their big nemesis. Yep. And the Army, okay, fine, do what you have to do. Well, when you look at the, the, the reasoning for the whole consideration for the attack in the first place, which is the exploration of resources, one of your biggest resource expenditures is the Navy uh, in terms of, of fuel and oil. Um, so there was going to be tension because in many ways the Army doesn't need to move west, east uh, anytime soon, as much as the Navy does. That's a great point. You're right. Uh, next question, guys. What? The, why the great failure of the British Intelligence Service, uh, especially with William Semple, uh, who was the one who assisted the Japanese almost from the end of the Great War until it became a naval power in 1941? I'm actually not that familiar with this. This particular case, Kevin. I'm not either, actually. I'd, I'd have to dig into that further. It's intriguing. I'm very yeah. intrigued. Yeah. Wow, we, uh, we piqued their curiosity. <laughs> That's the fun part of history, Eric, is, is the I, continued discovery. I know it is. I know it is. Um, and the next question, to what extent was racism a factor in not taking uh, Japanese military power seriously until it was too late? Can I, I'm going to interject quick, Chris, because it's just a comment that goes with it. The article that ran in most newspapers on the morning of December 7th on the continent of the United States is a quote from Secretary Hull of the uh, Navy. And he says that the United States Navy is second to none in the world, um, according to his assessment. He just needs more people. Um, so I'm just going to put that out there, Chris, to have you chew on that while you respond. There was, there was a racial component to assessing the Japanese. Um, you will see several times in the early part of the war where uh, there's an assumption on the part of Westerners that the Japanese can't be, have this good equipment because the Germans, the Germans must have sent them stuff. Yep. Um, that shows up in official reports and things like that. There's, there's popular misconceptions that the Japanese can't see in the dark. They can't shoot straight. Um, assumptions about their lack of prowess on the battlefield, things like that. Um, and that definitely clouds perception. And I think that's a factor in the thinking. It's also a factor in Japanese thinking, by the way. The Japanese are fighting an anti-colonial war and they gin up their troops. There's a, 
there's a pamphlet that they issued to everybody that was going into the South Seas called Read This and the War Can Be Won. And it talks about they are fighting not just to seize resources, but they are fighting to liberate the colonies from the oppression of the West. And it, it, there's a lot more language in there as well. But they both sides view um, the, through racist assumptions, make assumptions about the other side that ultimately uh, it clouds their thinking and affects their thinking and their strategy. Well, the Japanese can't see in the dark. Was that, I, I've, I've yet to hear that one. That's, <laughs> that's, some, uh, that's some next level hype there. Uh, next question. Um, why did the Japanese become involved in attacking the Soviet Union after the Nazi invasion in 1941? This was actually a major debate among the Japanese in July 1941. Do they go north? Do they go south? And there were two reasons that they didn't do it. The first was, as they said, we shouldn't miss the bus. And that's a direct quote. Shouldn't miss the bus by going south and taking advantage of, of weakness of the Western colonial powers. The second reason and more compelling reason is because the, the Japanese had already fought the Russians in 1939 at the, uh, the uh, border skirmish, ultimately the, known as the Nomanan campaign. And let's just say it did not go well, even though the Red Army in 1939 was not exactly the strongest force in the world, as the Finns will demonstrate in that winter, it doesn't go well for the Japanese. And so in the summer of 1941, few, it turns out a few months before the Germans invade, they'll sign a non-aggression pact with the Russians. And so you combine the memory of Nomanan 39 with this non-aggression pact and the luring thinking about going south. And uh, they decide that the best option for them is to, is to go eastward and to go southward and, and to take the strategy that they considered. And the last thing I'd mention as well is consider what the Japanese need, the resources the Japanese need. Yep. Those are not inside. That's not in Siberia. Right. <laughs> but it's definitely to the South. I think this might be our last question. Uh, didn't the Japanese use uh, submarines to shell the West Coast at least once? Yeah, I think we mentioned this in passing. They shelled Santa Barbara yep. um, and some oil, an oil, some oil refineries or something. I also got a note here that Semperl was a British naval advisor to the Japanese and gave them much military information in particular about aircraft carrier tactics. Uh, so your curiosity was piqued. I just gave you a little more information there and I'm sure both of you will be looking that up uh, with yeah. moments of this program concluding. Well, now uh, I'm even more curious because that was, that was obviously one of the targets, the main targets. And that was one of the reasons why, yes, the, the attack was successful in regard to, to, to slowing down the ability to respond, but not eliminating the ability to respond because, quote unquote, the flat tops weren't there. Uh, the, the question I just had up, uh, why didn't the Japanese press their advantage after the initial tax on Pearl Harbor? Why did they just decide to pack up and, and, and go back instead of taking full advantage of what they had already done? Kevin's asking Google, so I'll take the first step. Oh, I'm not this. asking Google. I'm responding to another one. There was a question about where Rhoda was, and I'm bringing up the, the map. Oh, okay. Gotcha. I'll let you do that, and I'll take this. Yep. The Japanese plan called for two strikes and then pull away because there was an assumption that the land base, whatever land-based air they didn't take on was going to go after the fleet and submarines, and there would still be an American reaction. Um, and so there was, it was based on that assumption. The Japanese did not, quite frankly, have the resources to mount an invasion of Hawaii at the same time that they struck everywhere else in the Pacific. So it was a question of priorities. There was some debate and there was some people that felt that the task force commander, Admiral Nagumo Chuichi, should have um, struck a third time. And in retrospect, failing to pay more attention to the actual infrastructure of the Pearl Harbor base was a major, major error on the part of the Japanese because you can knock out the fleet, but if the base is still there, 
it can still service and, and be of value to the United States, which it was, through, which Pearl Harbor was for the rest of the war. Yep. But again, that's why I, I emphasize the point we made in the discussion is think about Pearl Harbor not as an isolated operation, but it is simply one of a multi-pronged attack against the West and the Pacific. And that's something that uh, when you think of it in those terms, all of a sudden the, what the Japanese did and the way they, they structured the operation and they executed the operation against Hawaii makes a lot more sense. Yeah. Well, kind so, of on a similar, oh, sorry, go ahead, Kevin. No, uh, just answering the, the direct question um, uh, to me was, uh, where was the hospital located? And I believe we're actually joined by by the daughter or granddaughter, forgive me. Granddaughter, yep. Uh, of Rhoda Ziesler. Um, and she was located here at Schofield Barracks. Uh, each installation had its own, uh, most, a lot of installations, not each, um, but a lot of installations had their own hospital. Uh, uh, it wasn't just one single hospital on the entire island of Oahu. Um, but Rhoda was in particular here at Schofield, which is why if, if, uh, if you're familiar with her story, uh, she says, you know, they didn't know until the first patients arrived around 8.30 or 9.30 that it was truly an attack. They heard the explosions, they saw the planes, but they don't know until there's actually, you know, patients coming in because it's, they're not down here at Pearl Harbor where my cursor is. They're up here at Schofield. And that's what, 15, 20 miles, I think? Roughly, yeah. Yeah. Uh, kind of getting back to, to Chris's point uh, about not the J Japanese not pressing their attack. Um, the question comes from John. What extent did the Japanese have intelligence assets on the ground in Hawaii before the attack? Uh, that gave them uh, valuable intelligence about the U.S. forces. Kevin, did you want to take this one first? Uh, from what I know, I, I don't know as much about this as I should, um, but it is something that I that I know a little bit about. They had a few sources um, in terms uh, or ability to at least uh, uh, get some information about it. But they had actually a very detailed model of the installation. Um, and, that, and it is actually, there's some photographs online. I was going to use one for the presentation. Uh, so if you've ever seen the movie Pearl Harbor, you know, you've seen that part of the strategy and planning uh, area um, where, or part of the film where there's people literally standing in this pool and there's models of the battleships at exactly, you know, where they were. Um, that actually happened. And there's a great photograph of it, um, of them planning it. And it, it is almost like a true scale model. So the, the intelligence and awareness of the port itself um, was, very, was very good because that, again, to Chris's point, was their entire primary objective, was to disable the ships. I just put in the chat two books I'd recommend if people want to look at this more, But Not in Shame by John Toland and At Dawn We Slept by Gordon Prang. Um, both of those detail the, there was a consular officer that was sent about six months before the attack and a lot of the information and sketches about what that what that would look like or what the what the base looked like how the fleet was arrayed fleet movements when they were usually in port which was usually the weekends um, came from him and the the network that he had they were fairly quickly rounded up after the war started um, particularly because they rounded up all the diplomats and, and interned them and then ultimately repatriated the diplomats. But uh, it, at least up to December 7th, yeah, it was uh, the Japanese had very good intelligence of what to expect. Well, just, and uh, I, I'm just remembering as well, our last speaker that we had here a couple of weeks ago, Joseph Tukovsky, I was also talking about um, on the west coast of Hawaii, uh, there was a small village where Japanese uh, subs would put in and receive intelligence uh, from the Japanese population of that small town. Uh, mm -hmm. Very, very good spy network. Uh, and from what I understand, that town no longer exists. You can't even find it on a map anymore um, because of the uh, actions taken against them in that town during the war. I... Oh, Kevin, you, there you go. Thank you. I was sorry. I was just sharing that to show you that I quickly downloaded the, the, the image from online. And you cover the questions on the hospital, Kevin. I think that is all the questions we have for today, gentlemen. I do want to end with two last stories. And Chris, you can help me with these. 
um, because they're uh, in one in particular, especially tomorrow morning. Um, we, you know, this photo here, at Battleship Row. There's a Wisconsin. There's two medals of honor from Wisconsin uh, earned on this day, and one of them is on this ship here that I'm circling. Chris, could you tell us a little bit about just quickly this guy? That's uh, Captain Franklin Van Valkenburg of Arizona. And uh, when the attack starts, he goes up to the bridge and uh, is on the bridge, which is the forward one there. And it's the one in the photographs of the wreck later, you'll see, is bent over and blackened by fire. And when Arizona's magazine blows up right in front of him, he is, he's killed. His body's consumed in the, in the resulting fire. And the only thing they ever find of him is his Naval Academy ring. And, but for his leadership and his putting the, the ship into the defense, um, he is given a posthumous Medal of Honor. He's from Milwaukee. We've, and to Chris's point earlier, you know, if you're ever interested in more Wisconsin stories from Pearl Harbor, um, please feel free to reach out to us. And maybe it's something that we do a series of, or maybe a book, Chris. <clears throat> uh, we've actually identified uh, pretty much a Wisconsin uh, Badger on every single ship on Battleship Row, practically, um, from the Vestal uh, to the California down to the Nevada. Uh, sorry, I was just answering Shelley's question. Uh, yes, Shelley, as a matter of fact, we will have this, um, this program up on our YouTube channel. Uh, probably by Wednesday, it should be up. Um, and I believe you gentlemen are done. Uh, you guys have put out a lot of information today, uh, done a lot of talking. I hope you don't have any more meetings this afternoon. Um, and I would just like to thank both of you for all the fantastic uh, information you put out and for the great job you do. Everybody likes listening to you to talk. Uh, you have such a good rapport. And of course, your historical knowledge is unfathomable. Uh, and I would like to thank everybody for coming out and joining us today for our last curator conversation of 2021. Uh, we look forward to seeing everybody in 2022. Uh, please go to whizvetsmuseum.com uh, and you will find our complete event schedule there. Uh, I should turn my video on so everybody can see my happy smiling face. Um, uh, we do start the, the year off with uh, some book talks. Uh, so please look forward to those. And we've got a great lineup for 2022 as far as all of our virtual and in-person and in -person programming does, uh, goes. Uh, so thank you to everybody coming out today and we look forward to seeing you, you uh, next year. I hope you have a great holiday season. Uh, Kevin, Chris, thank you very much, gentlemen. And uh, we'll see everybody later.